Hello, my name is Mike Smoyer, President at Digital Government Institute. Thank you for joining us. For those of you new to DGI, thank you for joining. I hope you enjoy the program. Our topic today is empowering the government workforce with data, OPM's workforce evolution. Before we get started, there are a few things I'd like to share. First, you can submit a question in the audience console. We will address questions at the end of the presentations or we'll forward to the panel immediately following the program if we can't get to it. You can participate via the closing poll and the post-show survey. Anyone participating today that's interested in receiving CPE credits, to qualify, you must be online for the entire program. You must respond to the poll question and the post-event survey, and DGI will email you a CPE certificate at the completion probably a little bit later this week. We will also be forwarding a link up to the archive so you can view it again or share it with a colleague. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Jonathan Album, Federal CTO of ServiceNow. In this role, Jonathan works with federal agencies to deliver digital workflows that create great experience is and unlock productivity. Prior, he held a variety of senior executive positions in the federal government including serving as the CIO of USDA, where he led the development of USDA's IT modernization strategy, including cloud network modernization and enhanced information security. Jonathan, take it away. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, as Mike shared, I'm Jonathan Albaum, and I'm your moderator for today's panel. Uh, federal CTO for ServiceNow, and, but before ServiceNow, as Mike shared, I was a CIO in the federal government for many years. And throughout my federal career, uh, teams and I were always on a mission to modernize systems and manage data and really all with an effort to improve the way that the employees in our agencies were able to do their work. And with today's president's management agenda and its, and its primary pillar for strengthening empowering, and empowering the federal workforce, we really have a, a clarion call for focusing on employee experience. And you know, from my federal career, I know firsthand that when we provide our employees with great experiences, we create a really engaged workforce. And that leads to better customer experiences overall for people that rely on and, and, and use the federal government. And across government, there's no more, there's no agency that's more involved in this uh, focus on employee experience in the federal workforce than the Office of Personnel Management. They're charged with creating really the next generation of the federal workforce. And, you know, key to these efforts are employee experience. Then the use of data as a strategic asset is really a key to help us make informed decisions on policies and programs and, and think about the services that the federal government can offer. So today we have three excellent executives from OPM to join us in a conversation about the role that the agency is playing. And we're, we're gonna have a conversation that talks about government-wide approaches, we're gonna talk about data, and we're really gonna talk about how we um, innovate upon solutions that exist in the federal government and make a better uh, experience for employees that, that serve the American public. So I wanna now introduce our um, panelists. So as I call your name, please share a little bit about your background and your experience with employee experience. We'll, uh, we'll start with uh, Melvin Brown, who is the Deputy CIO for OPM. Hi, Melvin. Thanks for being here. Hey, hey Jonathan. Thanks for having me. And, uh, excited to be here. Melvin Brown, Deputy CIO here. Been here a little bit, a little, little more than two years now. Uh, excited about what we're doing. Um, and, and in close partnership with our, our, our business partners, you know, we're re-looking at how we do employee engagement. And we're starting to look at the data that's coming out of our data shop to help us make data-driven decisions. And so I'm excited about that, uh, pushing the envelope on pushing the tools that we need um, to the employees at the end of the, the spectrum, if you will. So putting business intelligence tools on their desktops so that they can um, create those data-driven decisions even inside their organization. So excited to be here and happy to talk about this stuff. Thank you, Melvin. Um, next, I'd like to have Steve Kraus say hello. Steve is the Senior Advisor in the HR Quality Service Management Office, QSMO, you might know it as, and um, also part of the HR line of business at OPM. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jonathan, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so just to give a brief introduction to myself, um, 
I've been in the federal government now for about eight years, and uh, that entire time I've worked on programs that have involved uh, government-wide transformation of one business function or another. Uh, GSA, I led the stand-up of the government-wide category management program in the acquisition space. About two years ago, I came over to OPM, and I lead two offices here, the HR QSMO and the HR line of business. Um, the HR line of business is charged with working across agencies to define the set of standards that agencies agree to converge upon in the way that they manage human capital management functions. And the QSMO is charged with standing up a marketplace of both federal and commercial solutions that agencies can use in operationalizing those standards. So that's what I do here. Thanks, Steve. And last and certainly not least is Ted Kalk, who is the Deputy Director of Human Capital Data Management and Modernization and also the Chief Data Officer for OPM. Ted, uh, welcome. Uh, hi, Jonathan. It's great to uh, be with you and, and the audience and our, and our team at OPM here. Um, had a chance to come over to OPM and, and serve in the Chief Data Officer role over the past couple of years. In my previous role, I served as the Chief Data Officer at the United States Department of Agriculture, where we stood up um, enterprise analytics uh, platforms and programs to be able to enable the agency to leverage its data as a strategic asset. And really fundamental to uh, both of these efforts has been the focus on customer experience and employee experience uh, in the use of data. So looking forward to uh, talking about the connection between those things with you all today. Um, thanks, Ted. I think we're going to have a great conversation. I want to go ahead and get started with uh, uh, a question for you about the OPM data strategy. You published a data strategy in March of this of this year. Can you um, kick us off by talking a little bit about the data vision and goals uh, that the agency has? Sure. And I think our, our data strategy is really laser focused on uh, employee experience uh, from from Kind of, kind of conception to kind of where we are right now. Um, you know, OPM is the chief human resources agency. It's the personnel policy manager for the federal government. Uh, we are uniquely positioned to help rebuild, empower, and support the federal workforce. And so we conceived of our data strategy within that, uh, within that construct and mandate as part of our larger OPM strategic plan. And we have four goals in our data strategy. They're really focused on two key core areas, and they're around the ways in which OPM can provide government-wide support uh, to agencies uh, in a couple of key areas. The first, and of course, I think central to the conversation today, is our ability to develop a strong data-driven culture and a highly skilled data analytics workforce across the federal government and the ways in which OPM can contribute to that. Um, with any uh, individual agency uh, data strategy, and certainly as we're thinking about this government-wide, um, people are our most important asset to be able to leveraging data and so we've set a couple of key goals within our work at OPM as part of our data strategy to ensure agencies have those right, the right resources there. The first is really thinking about the competencies needed at the, at the leadership level. Um, we did observe that you know, other countries like Australia had incorporated data fluency into their uh, executive core competencies. So we've set a goal of um, updating the uh, government-wide executive core competencies to include uh, data fluency uh, as part of you know, building that pipeline for the right competencies that we'll need now and going forward into the future and um, how that'll translate into the kinds of development uh, employees as they move up the leadership chain uh, are engaging in. The second is really around developing the data skills of the federal workforce. And this involves having the right competencies. We released uh, AI competencies earlier uh, uh, this year. We're also uh, have been engaging in government-wide hiring actions for, for data analysts. There's been a couple of those and have been successful in bringing on uh, data scientists who are really attracted by, you know, the, the competitive mission we have in government. Uh, we've been working with the Chico Council and Steve on promoting human capital uh, data collaboration so that we can work with practitioners across government uh, in better using human capital data. Uh, and again, really focused on the skills of the broader workforce. So those are a couple of examples. The other area that we're focused on is um, related to the fact that OPM has data on uh, really the entire employee life cycle. We have data on uh, 2.1 current federal employees, uh, federal retirees and, and annuitants. We have data on uh, talent acquisition, benefits, demographics, uh, and OPM is really centrally positioned to be able to provide government-wide decision support for agencies. 
Uh, so along with our data strategy in April, it's been about four full months since we did release that at opm.gov forward slash data if folks are interested in, in seeing the full strategy. We also published our first uh, data portal with some public data products, and we've been working with agencies using human-centered design to be able to answer common questions and to democratize access to this data. So our other goals are really focused on delivering high quality human capital data products across government that inform and support critical decision making. Uh, this includes uh, dashboards we've been working on related to demographics and attrition and federal employee viewpoint survey. Uh, so we can make that available to agencies across government at scale. Of course, there are also a number of questions that only OPM uh, can answer uh, that we're also working on from an analytics perspective, you know, in the area of um, uh, attrition, for example, being able to focus on where attrition is most acute, uh, what's the makeup of those departing staff, and then really being able to ramp up the maturity and analytics from descriptive to, to diagnostic and prescriptive. That's something we're going to be focused on uh, this year. But that, that idea of having a seamless customer experience for uh, a one-stop shop for agencies to come in and, sh and access government-wide decision support tools and the ability for federal employees to have a seamless experience with access to their own data is really central to our, our overall data strategy. That's going to require collaboration across all of our programs. Uh, so we have uh, uh, a common approach for developing those products and obviously tons and tons of coordination and support from the CIO office and building the technology platforms that we'll, that we'll need to be able to support this work. So really excited about where we are with that strategy. Uh, uh, very good, Ted. Now, um, for those of you that don't know, in addition to Ted's role as Chief Data Officer at OPM, he leads the <laughs> Chief Data Officer Council for the federal government. And Ted, if just for a moment, you can share a little bit about how OPM's data strategy and some of the uh, right. government-wide data sets you're describing may have an impact or okay. what kind of support you're getting from CDOs across uh, across the federal landscape. Yeah, I mean, the, the CDO Council um, started at, at the uh, with the Evidence Act back in January of 2020. So it, it'll, we're coming up on four full years of having this requ new required role in government. So we've really been keeping an eye on what is working for agency CDOs in developing those programs uh, and what is it going to take for us to get to, let's say, CDO 2.0 as we're kind of moving into the first four years. So one of the <laughs> common problems that we've been focused on over the, over the past several years of the council's existence has been how do we share decision support at scale? And so mm -hmm. we actually worked in the pandemic to develop some government-wide dashboards. We ran into some uh, uh, you know, benefits, but also some challenges <coughs> regarding the existing infrastructure. And that dovetailed into a report that we did on human capital dashboards and how we might share decision support across government. So that report, which we published, I think is we're also implementing some of those recommendations from the CDO council at OPM. So there's a good through line between the kinds of common problems that are being surfaced in the council and the work that we're doing at OPM. Um, of course, we're also focused on data skills and those kinds of efforts that OPM is committed to in the strategy. And then one other area that I think is just worth noting is um, agencies have also been moving toward this, uh, this enterprise analytics approach where they're standing up these common platforms and they need to integrate data so they can leverage it at scale. Uh, and so we're observing where those agencies have, have have moved those things forward. And it turns out that's where they've had the most success in terms of accruing resources and being able to deliver value to the organization. So we're, we're codifying that in some reports on uh, enterprise analytics and another one on uh, what it means to be a data-driven CDO, right? We're, we're asking our organizations to be data-driven. How do we measure our own success in the CDO function so we can step up to that level, next level of maturity? So those are some through lines. Yeah, and and are, are you seeing uh, that government-wide focus on, on employee data and employee experience? Is that you know, a thread throughout all the agencies? I mean, it's the most common, potentially the most common kind of data that every agency is going to be managing. Yeah, I mean, what you typically see is that agencies will either start with mission data or, or they will start with the data that's common, you know, in terms of HR. So at USDA, this is where we started, was how do we answer those common questions that everyone is trying to answer around time to hire attrition uh, so that we, we can reduce the manual level of effort for those agencies, again, coming back to customer experience and accessing, you know, the, the answers to those common questions. So that challenge uh, has come up, I think, uh, across government as a, as a common challenge where agencies may have access to data from a set of component agencies, but they don't have that enterprise view. So that's one area where OPM can deliver value, but it's also an area where agencies themselves, I think, continue to lean in. So I want to I want to uh, move on to Steve for a second, and and Steve, the uh, this government-wide concept 
you know, uh, whether it's employee data or any other kind of uh, data or management process around employee experience. I'm curious from your role in the HR Cusmo and line business, what you're seeing and, you know, right. what data do you have access to? What is that data telling you? <clears throat> well, so, so a couple of things. So, so first of all, Ted did a great job of outlining the government-wide nature of the conversations that we're having. And one of the things that you end up noticing fairly quickly is that it requires kind of a systems thinking approach because you really have this network of service providers in the community. You have OPM kind of at the core. We have a number of federal and commercial shared service providers, and then you have agencies, and all of us are working together to, tr to try to provide services to the federal workforce. You know, in my introduction, what I pointed out is that the, the offices that I lead focus on defining standards and then helping agencies to operationalize those standards. But really, a lot of what's going on across the community is both agencies and shared service providers are working very hard to modernize and upgrade their systems, the platforms, and the services that they can provide through those to the employees. So first of all, the, the standards end up being enormously important in order to do all the things that we're talking about and to do that in sort of a, a systems-wide approach. And so OPM actually over the last several years, you know, including predating my time there, have been working across the agencies to build a set of business process and data standards that the community could could, could agree on. And uh, just within the last few months, we've gotten to a point of completion where those standards are now publicly available. We made them available uh, for industry and public comment for the first time earlier this year. And they're now posted in complete form on a website, a GSA website uh, called ussm.gov, which houses a lot of shared services information. Um, but we expect those standards to be really influential, uh, both in um, uh, you know sort of improving the conversation between industry and government in terms of how these you know functions and things get done. But they're also critical then to being able to pull the data together from the agencies and make sense of it uh, in the way that Ted was talking about, building government-wide dashboards, analytic tools, pictures that the that the entire community can uh, can see and use to make better decisions. Um, and then the the modernization efforts that the agencies and SSPs are going through are critical because if you don't have modern uh, IT platforms and systems. Um, that adhere to these standards, it's really difficult then to get the right data in a timely manner with high quality. So how, how is that impacting employee experience as you see it? <laughs> well, you know, I could answer that question on a variety of levels, right, in terms of the, the state of employee experience. It, it, it's widely variable, I would say, today from, from agency to agency across the community. That's one of the things that, that I think we observe. But it's also a, a big focus of the current administration and of the president's management agenda, as you pointed out. I mean, it's a huge, um, it's, it's a huge focus of pillar one within the within the PMA and, and a lot of the things that we're that we're doing. Um, one of the things that I see is a, a big move within the agencies to improve uh, employee experience by improving the state of things like self-service. Um, the integration of processes and workflows, um, both HR and, and, and workflows that extend beyond um, just HR to facilities and security and, and elsewhere, um, but also in terms of just uh, giving employees better access to their own data, right? So when we talk about empowering the workforce with data, part of it is kind of at the systemic um, level in terms of how we pull that data to make better decisions. Part of it, quite frankly, is improving employee experience by giving them better access to their own data, which is a lot of what the more modern HR IT systems enable people to do. Uh, I mean, having access to data is very important, understanding what to do with it and what it means. Something additional, we can talk about that more in, in a bit, but I just wanted to give you a chance to give the um, Accuse Mo and a uh, lot of business a little plug. How do agencies get access to to your services? If we have agencies listening that want to want to dive into the modernization process. Well, absolutely. Uh, so the first um, the, the first answer to that is just just reach out. Uh, we have um, 
email boxes, hrqsmo at opm.gov and hrlov at opm.gov. Um, but we are actually working with several agencies who are moving forward with these HRIT modernization efforts. And, you know, one of the things that we're finding is um, we, we've done a lot of work to inventory the systems and the modernization efforts that, that agencies are, are going through. One of the things that you find when you do that is there really is a fairly finite number of commercial IT companies that agencies are, are working with. Um, and so it really behooves us to, to kind of uh, put our thinking caps on together, figure out how we standardize requirements, as well as how we can communicate with those IT vendors um, uh, together. And um, um, that, that helps us um, kind of clarify our demand signal to the market, as, as well as um, you know, do a better job of negotiating for features and functions and price and things of that nature. So that the short answer is, is just reach out. We're, we're here and our line is always open. Well, very good. Uh, M Melvin, I, I, wanna, I wanna jump over to you now. And you know you have a huge responsibility keeping OPM systems running. Having been a CIO, I mean, I know it's a very complicated uh, job. So, but it's more than just uh, systems within OPM, you have a much wider scope of responsibilities. Can you talk uh, a little bit about the range of uh, systems and uh, requirements that, that your office manages? Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, that's, that's you know, when you stop and think about it, uh, I, I like the way Ted talked about it. I mean, we've got USA Jobs, USA Staffing, USA Learning, you know, and those those systems cover the, the plethora of the entire federal government. Uh, and then we've got also the retirees. And so we've got we've got every every system that touches every employee, even including, you know, our federal health benefits systems that we kind of some of them are outsourced, but we still provide oversight and management for. And so that all that the richness of that data uh, is, is huge. Uh, and so, you know, how do we how do we share that data in a, in a way that, you know, agencies can leverage? And, and I, I go back to Steve's point about, you know, these these government wide dashboards and we had we've had great success, but it it was bumpy in the, in the beginning, uh, as Ted can attest. And, and the bumps was really around the inequities, I think, around modernization and then just our federated approach and, and our ability to be, become fe more federated and, and being able to do it in a, in a manner that's safe and secure. I mean, we recently got the new cybersecurity order on multi factor authentication where all of our systems have to be MFA by the end of the calendar year. Well, that's gonna, that's gonna also impact our ability to, to share data. And so just having to, you know, trying to figure out a way to maintain um, some level of a transparency and consistency and do it in a safe and secure manner um, so that we don't create inequities of data to where we, we have the haves and the have nots. And so we don't wanna leave agencies behind that might be um, less modern than other agencies, and so that's that's kind of what we're what we're trying to do right now. Um, and and we're we're making great strides, and I'm happy to have um, partnered with Ted and, and and Steve on that specifically around the government wide dashboard because those are paying great dividends for us uh, and for the entire federal government. So that that's pretty much where we are with that. Yeah, I mean the the, the dashboards sound like a big opportunity, you know, to create some equity around the data that everyone has, right? You know, we we only know what we know or data we have access to. Now, once everybody has, you can take different approaches. You can talk a little bit about what, what it takes to get these dashboards up and running, um, how, how complex it is, how do people get access to it, where, you know, where do these dashboards live? And, you know, um, Melvin, feel, feel free to get started and Ted, jump in if, if you'd like to. Well, I, I know that, that they, they started with just some basic HR data. I know we started with some of the DEIA work early on um, in sharing the DEIA data uh, with, with government agencies. And we started to roll that out and, and expand that. And then we started to bring on um, more federal agencies as we, began, as we began to solve some of our technology authentication challenges with access to, to the dashboards and the systems. I think we just cracked the nut uh, on some of the, our DOD partners. And so now we're able to share uh, share that data with them. And so Ted, I'll, I'll punt that to you uh, on on where we are with some of those. But that's I know that's been huge. Yeah, I mean on the technical side, 
you know, Melvin's team has been just fantastic. This is a, you know, first in government type of effort. And it really is solving some of those um, government-wide challenges that, the, that I was talking about with the CDO Council. So it's really exciting to see that and have this uh, great partnership. You know, one of the uh, aspects of this in terms of development, making sure we're building the right products, um, that kind of goes back to the customer experience or employee experience. It's really around human centered design. You know, I think about, you know, being in the CIO shop in at USDA at the department, you can be somewhat disconnected from the agencies if you're not careful. I think even more so to PM government wide. So we've been very careful and intentional about using human centered design and ideation sessions and bringing in the agencies and customers to help us understand what are all the common questions that we need to be answering and what are the ones that we need to be answering first and foremost. And so we've built those teams around um, iterative development, getting feedback from our customers, and then uh, piloting these tools. So we're, we're in the process now of starting a government-wide rollout that, that will move into the fall for some of these core products. The other, I think, really helpful thing is, is you know, as Steve talked about, is the systems thinking, right? That we're able to um, meet with agencies around a common set of data, a common set of insights, and, and make them better at scale. Uh, but it also is going to enable us to have a, a a better level of maturity around common definitions as we're engaging with the uh, data analytics community to practice with practitioners across government. So I think it's a starting point for not only the technical enablement but a, a ramping up of our capacity. With with the largest workforce in the in the country, we probably have the largest number of HR analysts in the country. So how can we how can we best leverage that you know uh, together uh, while making sure that agencies need to need answer their their agency specific questions as well. Ted, I'll offer the same uh, uh, opportunity for uh, for a plug for this work. Uh, how do agencies get yeah. involved? If not, uh, we have somebody on, you know, listening who wants to participate in this. How do they do, go about getting involved? Well, we have established a new role at agencies. Uh, this is very new. Uh, it's called the Human Capital Data Champion. So those individuals are going to be working with us to drive adoption of these products and we'll be over, overseeing you know, access to OPM's data products. We'll also be focused on improving the timeliness and quality of the data that's sent to OPM since there is that important feedback loop between what agencies submit and what they end up seeing in these products. We mm -hmm. also have, uh, and Steve can talk more about this perhaps, uh, the Human Capital Data Analytics Community of Practice uh, that meets monthly. Uh, any feedback on the dashboards, you can reach out to me directly. It's uh, theodore.cowick at opm.gov or, or datadrivenworkforce at opm.gov if you want to email directly. And Steve, just building on that real quick, I know in some of the conversations we've had, you, you've talked a lot about, you know, you're only as good as the data you're getting. You know, you're trying to make decisions. If you have incomplete data, you might not make the right decision. W what, are, what are you and the QSMO doing to strengthen, you know, that connection between uh, the data you need and the data you have. Yeah. Well, so I mean, first and foremost, as as Ted was mentioning, one of the things we did is we we stood up this data analytics community of practice um, just about a year ago. Actually, we did that under the auspices of the Chico Council and um, a working group that they stood up, which was a data working group under the Chico Council. So, you know, data data analytics and data analytics capabilities are are a hot topic and something that that people care about across that community. So when we realized that, we stood up this community of practice, uh, but within just a few months, we had literally over 350 people from across a variety of agencies uh, signed up as part of this community. The community meets on a monthly basis, um, and a lot of those meetings tend to be kind of show and tell with different agencies coming and kind of just sort of discussing what they've done, what you know observations they've made or finding and things they've been able to to do and and, and to share. Um, but as this evolves and matures, we're also finding that that community is a great source uh, for staffing projects and things of that nature. So, you know, um, the OMB memo that came out earlier this year on organizational health and performance, I think really kind of lit a fire and, and created an impetus for agencies to make better and sort of a more concerted use of data, both human capital data and mission data to make decisions around things like return to office and, and things of that nature. Um, we've used the connectivity that we've built with the data analytics community of practice as a, as a way of <clears throat> both getting agencies familiar with these tools that OPM is building, talk to each other about you know the things that they've done, and we're going to be standing up things like office hours where agency personnel can come in and 
kind of learn from each other or from OPM to just get a sense of, you know, you know, what some of the leading minds in the community are thinking and doing with that data right now. Very good. Uh, Melvin, how do these uh, concepts that Ted and Steve were talking about apply internally to HR, IP systems and data at OPM? So one of the things that we've been doing, and I'll, I'll take what we've been doing on, on Postal, which is, you know, our, our newest initiative, you know, we've been, you know, using ideation and journey maps to kind of lay out what it is that we wanted to do with our postal implementation. And as a result of that, we were able to, you know, deliver, you know, one of our major modules, which was Carrier Connect with, within five months. Uh, and so that refining that, that approach and then looking at it going forward, you know, how do we take that to the next level? So we're trying to build a culture of, of, of leveraging the lessons that we have learned based on the data that we have, that we have and then ask ourselves a new question, you know, what, what is it that we need to learn next and then what data is available? Uh, in order to answer that question. So that's that's helped us out a lot. The other thing that, that Ted and both Steve mentioned is that, you know, we've got a, a huge upskilling going on. And so now um, we're starting to look at, you know, how do we bring in the right talent, but then upskill them going forward. So we've got a, an enterprise skills initiative going on where we're, we're upskilling both um, our existing employees, but making sure we're hiring people that have the skills. Ted had the luxury uh, and I get to pick on him a little bit. He had the luxury of building out a team from scratch. So he got the, he got the hire the skills, you know, on day one, which was helpful. Uh, whereas in the CIO shop, um, we're, we're building up that muscle and building those skills. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we're approaching that going forward. And, and we're, we're, um, we're leveraging a lot of the best practices that, that Ted has used as far as, you know, what does the skills of tomorrow look like and, and what, what do we need to do? Um, our intern program has been phenomenal. And so we're starting to use um, use our interns to one infuse ourselves with new uh, early career talent that has a lot of the the data and analytic skills that we're going to need going forward. So that's been extremely popular and extremely helpful. Um, and so that's that's what we're doing right now. I think you know you're making a, a great point about um, the data skills. You've all sort of mentioned this. You know the data is uh, timeless, if you will. You know, the technology around it changes, uh, but if you understand the data and you understand how it flows through the government or through the agency out to OPM and what it means, there are so many opportunities that will avail themselves, you know, to you, to an individual professionally or to, to the agency to take advantage of it, uh, irrespective of the underlying, you know, technology. So I think that's an important message for people to take away from this data skills and ir where, irrespective of where you are in your career. Enhance your data skills. Take advantage well, of something. So let me let me let me pull on that thread for a little bit, John, yeah. because the the other piece that I want to highlight is is the reason the early career talent and the interns are so important is because they don't bring the same historical baggage that existing people bring, and and I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's sometimes you know too much. You already know what you think the answer is. And the interns or the early career talent are asking different questions. They're yeah. asking a, a different art of tomorrow or a different art of what's possible that's helping to move our organization in a different direction. And so they don't they don't know that they couldn't do something. And so because they don't know that they couldn't do something, they're doing it now. And that's yes. that's been key to our modernization is sometimes you know, maybe you know too much. And so I try not to pair my interns up with existing people in the organization we try to give them a fresh problem give them the new data that they have and let them figure out what the solution looks like and that's that's given us good results so far yeah that's a great point and ted you've had some early career folks on your team you, you, yeah. you mentioned right you know talk about that a little bit no that's a, it's been a blessing and so you know melvin was alluding to that i think um there's, there's a couple of through lines here i think uh that it could bring up relationship to what Melvin was just sharing, which was really, really good. Um, you know, we, we did actually utilize the U.S. Digital Core, and uh, you know, I've just heard very, very positive things about that across the board in terms of tech talent uh, from agencies. From what I've heard, I've, I've not heard a bad thing, let's put it that way. And we've had a very, very positive experience bringing in um, a, a product manager and a data scientist using the U.S. Digital Core. So really exciting to get, you know, those fresh perspectives into the agency quickly. And, and both of those individuals have been a a core part of some of the products uh, and services we've been building. The, the other connection I could draw that kind of ties together the whole conversation today is 
is really around the relationship, especially with this technical talent, um, with the technology that we have once they arrive. So, you know, what we what we have found is that we do have the ability to recruit top talent into government. The mission is unparalleled. The State Department was hiring 50 data scientists. They brought in a young woman named Charlotte McClintock, who within the first year was providing on the ground support with analysis and climate negotiations in Egypt. What, a, what an amazing opportunity to be able to contribute to the, the business of government. Um, but what is also true is that we will not be able to retain this talent if they don't have access to the right tools and technology to be able to use the skills that they have. And so our modernization efforts, I think, directly support, especially on the technical side, re retaining the talent uh, and, and, and being able to enable them. So I liked how Melvin talked about giving them the space to be able to really utilize their skills. That was something we found to be true at USDA where certain agencies had trouble keeping the right talent. And once they had the right tools, they found that to be less, much less challenging. So that is one thing that we do need to address in government. So people want their work life. People want their work life to look like the real life. I hear that all the time. You know, from a technology perspective. Steve, jump in here. Then I want to get to to yeah. an audience question that builds on what Ted was just uh, suggesting. Sure. I just wanted to draw a line from this to another aspect of this conversation, which is the changes that modernization brings in terms of the type of talent that we actually need in the workforce. So one of the things that we're finding is we work with agencies and they are talking about implementing you know, software as a service, cloud-based solutions, improving and modernizing their HR platforms and whatnot. It really changes the nature of the HR function, the people who are using these platforms, what types of skills we need in that workforce. So you know, when we talk about empowering the workforce with data, you also need to be thinking about the workforce is itself a moving target in terms of the profile of what that workforce is comprised of and you know we need to we need to think about that as well yeah it's a it's a it's a good point and it ties to another audience question which i'll i'll i'll, I'll deal i'll deal with first and then get to the second one um but th th this suggests uh someone in the audience is suggesting can we pair uh, older employees, and not necessarily age, but the, when I say old, people who have maybe more experience in the agency who probably have a lot of uh, very important information about the agency and policies and processes and maybe what's worked in the past with some of these uh, employees that are newer who might look at the data and see something different, who might not know uh, that we tried and failed at a project in the past. Have you had any success or you've tried to um, create some pairings? to maybe get more out of that combination. I I I have and and I I did it later after they had come up with the idea because I didn't want them to be restricted by the we tried that and it didn't work because you never step in the river the same time. And, and so every time you step in the river it's a new set of water. And so the climate and the conditions for that change are different. The people are different. The times are different. The technology is different. Everything's different. Nothing remains the same. And so just because we tried it and it failed doesn't mean that the solution wasn't good. It just may not have been the right time for the solution. Right time, uh, yeah. may, not been, may not have been the right climate for the solution. And so I let them try to come up with a solution first, then bring in the, um, the existing employees to give me the risks associated with things that I need to avoid as we roll it out. That way I don't stymie the creativity of the person trying to um, solve the problem. Because if they're already starting with it, we've already failed. Now I've brought down their excitement about the art of what's possible. And so that's, right. that's how I've approached it. And inspire the to work. creativity, yeah. Correct. Um, and that's, yeah. that has worked for us. And, and what what about this idea that you know that you might have an employee who's been around a long time and maybe they don't feel like they need to uh, and build data skills or create, you know uh, move in um, do something different you you, you find the that marriage between that uh, that that newer employee and the more experienced employee is that have you seen that inspiration flow into that you know more experienced employee say hey I want to learn either some of these new technologies or I want to learn about data. I want to be able to participate in this. Because if I have these skills with everything I know, well, I could be really impactful in the organization. Ted, Ted you look like you want to say something. Well, I might just uh, you know, talk about the way in which certain skill sets that we may have had for a long time are coupled with new skill sets to create a better outcome, right? So 
for example, you know, at OPM, we've been collecting data, I think, well for, for many, many years. Um, we've also been doing analysis on that, that informs policy. I think one of the things that we're also bringing to the table to combine on our teams is to bring like the skill sets that we talked about, which is human-centered design, so that the products we're building are more suited to the agency needs and so that we can create the incentive to improve data collection. So we want to show, I think with with our with you know the, the mix of skill sets that we have for folks who have been here a long time and those who have joined us more recently, how all of our work fits together and how maybe some of the new competencies that we're bringing on board complement their work and actually help them achieve their work, their, their the goals that they've had more easily. Again, if we create products that meet the agency needs, there's an incentive for them to send us more high quality data. So that's the kind of conversation we've been having with our teams is um, is thinking about it in those terms. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we may need to bring some new skill sets to 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 make it more interdisciplinary and to right. to, to, to add to virtuous to you get the right data, you get the right better products, more reason to dig out more data to create more products. Um, it, it just one other question I want to get to. Um, there there's a, a note here about what um, if anything is OPM doing or can OPM do. Maybe this is in the line of HR line of business, uh, Steve, where um, you know some agencies have funding for these HR IT modernizations and employee experience and human centered design, and other agencies might not. We exper experienced this at USDA when I was there, uh, certainly, and it's just um, the nature of government at times. We're not funded. All agencies are not funded the same way, or they might have different priorities where the money goes. So how do agencies without the resources maybe be prepared to take advantage of these ideas and services and be positioned that um, if they get some money, they could get really far fast because they've done this pre-work. Yeah. Well, I mean, so this is a real discussion topic that we're having here at OPM as we're trying to, you know, upgrade the community's uh, availability and, and use of, of data and data analytics. But this is really kind of a, a classic example of where something like shared services comes into play, right? Uh, the fact that, you know, if you have an agency, whether it's a, you know, a national finance center or an interior business center or an OPM, who has the resources and a mission that's you know uh, oriented towards being able to you know build a particular service or capability once and then allow a lot of different constituents to to utilize it. Um, it it's you know that that whole model is designed you know specifically to mitigate or de defray those types of issues. And and this is what we do find is that if you look across the community, the the agencies that are making the best use and, and getting the best value out of the existing shared service providers tend to be smaller agencies that don't have a lot of resources to build their own HR systems and, and, and departments themselves, and they're getting a lot of value out of that. When it comes to these data analytics tools, you know, what we, what we observe right off the bat is there are, there's more people doing human capital data analytics outside of OPM than there is that OPM. But you also observe that that does sort of align itself very much into like these haves and have nots kind of the way that you're talking about. And I think what we need to do is kind of build a system where OPM can learn from the agencies that may be more advanced in some respects than we are, but then we can institutionalize some of the great things that, that those agencies are doing and make that available to the community at large. And, and that's, you know, sort of the, the strategy, one strategy anyway, for you know, enabling the agencies that don't have those resources to get access to those capabilities. Well, I think I think sometimes the hardest part is getting started on a project, and you know whether um, you know it's internal resources or it is uh, funding you think you need for uh, you know a, a, a contractor or somebody to come help. Um, getting started, you know, has all of these roadblocks. You know, I need the I don't have the people, I don't have the money. But if people turn to the to the QSMO, to the HR line of business, there's there are materials or resources that can get me over that hurdle of getting started. Well, now you have some momentum and, um, you know, momentum has a lot of power in the government in terms of getting things funded and, and forward. So. Yeah, not only that, but I mean, we're collaborating with agencies in a couple of different cases on the building out of like technology modernization fund proposals mm -hmm. and that oh. nature. So, 
there, That's there are, in, in addition to kind of these, you know, starter resources that we have, artifacts and whatnot from within the QSMO and the HR line of business, we can also work with agencies to develop strategies and get some of you know some more advanced seed funding. So there, there are a variety of kind of stair step approaches for um, for doing the kinds of things you're talking about. So um, this so that that's great. I didn't I didn't know you were doing that. I think a lot of people in the audience will find that very interesting. And again, reach out to Steve if there's interest in getting started. Um, I, I'm curious for for all of you who've done a lot of these projects uh, and you're in the middle of them now. Let's assume that we are using these resources Steve provided or Steve Steve uh, described, and we have we have money for technologies and these things. Those aren't problems necessarily. Uh, where do agencies get started beyond, you know, these first steps? Like, where do you start? Do you start with the process? Do you start with the data? Do you start with the current systems? What does your experience tell you, um, Melvin? I'm curious where and the projects you're describing. Where where did where did you start? I, I started with one. What was the problem that we're trying to solve? I, I started there. I started just. I, tr I started small by just trying to get the low hanging fruit of you know where is it that we can, to your point, build momentum, and then define what the problem is that we we have to solve, and then looking at you know what is my current capacity to solve that problem. I I, I think that if you even if you try to solve a problem that you know is there and you don't have the capacity, you don't build the momentum that you need to go forward. So that's the approach that we've taken is, you know, defining something that's going to, a problem that's going to deliver deliver value for the employees and for the, for the business. We start there and we start small. And then we look at, you know, what's our capacity to match that. And then the other point that I'll make is, is I know we're, we're, we're running short on time. The other point that I will make is sustainment and consistency for the long term. Um, to Ted's point, we, we can bring in the early career talent because we've got more modern tools and we're solving more modern problems. But if we don't, as we say inside CIO, if we don't get current and stay current, then we're not going to be able to maintain the momentum and the talent that, that we continue to bring in. So getting current and staying current is one of our, you know, it's one of our guiding principles here inside the CIO. That's a, it's a good suggestion. Focus on the problem you're solving, and you know, in my experience, when that problem has a strong tie to the mission, and you can point to a mission outcome, you have another, you have some rocket fuel tied to that, especially as you're looking for money. Uh, Ted, I'm curious from where you sit, where do agencies, uh, you know, get started? So we 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 know we got to figure out what the what the problem is, what we're trying to accomplish. Number one, what what, what comes next from your perspective? Well, I, I think from an analytics perspective, you know, very similar to, to, to Melvin's comments, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish on OPM and our ability to provide solutions at scale. We, we're the only agency that has this data. And so there are just so many common problems that we can solve efficiently for agencies. But I think the, the approach that an agency would use would be the same, which is engaging with customers through divergent, convergent thinking exercises and really asking them the biggest and best questions that they can come up with and really getting them in a place where they're comfortable asking those questions because they may have an experience of not having access to the data that they need to answer those questions. But to really think about our broad vision, we got to get them into a space where they're comfortable saying, I'm not sure how we're going to get there, but here's really the question I would want to answer. And of course, we're going to have to start with the data we have access to. And that's what we've done with these initial products. But we've also uncovered some uh, other uh, data assets that may be beneficial for us to answer those long-term questions. And because of the scale and the ability of us to provide value you know, at that broad scale, I think we're going to be able to get around to those uh, other questions as well as we go forward and, be, and build toward that. So again, I think I think the human-centered design principles apply uh, anywhere, and, and really should start with those um, as you're building any kind of analytics or technical solutions. You'd be talking to your customers, pulling them into the conversation, asking what you know to Melvin's point, what do you, what are you trying to accomplish, or how do you do your work? What what is your expectation as you interact with the system? That's going to change maybe the way you approach your your project, and I think that uh, excellent advice again. And you know, Steve, just building on this theme of getting started and being successful, um, I could be at an agency and come to the Cusmo, and I could say help, and you're going to say, well, you need to do some work. <laughs> you know, I just can't. You know, it, beyond what's the problem or whatever, what what is the upfront kind of activity? an agency needs to do, be prepared to be successful 
in interacting with the with the Cusmo and taking advantage of these. You know, if you're going to come with a technology modernization fund request, I have to do something beforehand, surely. W what are those? Well, yeah. So there's there's a couple of different dimensions to that. I mean, one one aspect is to really think about your business case for what you're trying to accomplish, and this kind of goes back to Melvin's point about make sure you know what problem you're trying to solve and, and things of that nature. Yeah, and so that's particularly relevant if you're preparing like a TMF proposal and whatnot. But the other aspect I would say that we've kind of touched on here is just get smart and make sure that you know what resources you really have that you should be leveraging throughout the community so that you're not unnecessarily reinventing the wheel yourself. Um, part of that is get to know the standards. The standards have been built for a reason and our drive as we go forward is going to be to make sure that both agencies and our industry partners understand and have a chance to um, converse about and, and um, help optimize, but you know, agree on how to use these standards um, so that it'll help us help us all go faster. Um, and um, you know, I, I think what we're seeing in the realm of HRIT modernization is um, more and more receptivity to agencies and, and other entities getting together and collaborating on requirements and things of that nature. Part of that, frankly, is just driven by the market itself. If you look at what's going on across the market space, there is, like I said, a finite number of these large scale software as a service platforms that are available. They, they don't lend themselves to customization in the way that the previous generations of this technology have. It actually um, leads to a situation where it's much more reasonable for agencies to get together and say, you know, what are our joint requirements? So the, the, the fact that when, when agencies feel like they're on their own and they feel like they need to go and invent all this on their own, they, they tend to do it a lot less efficiently. And, uh, you know, the, the era that we're moving into, I think, is one that's just not going to be affordable, much less desirable. So I think, I think there's strength in numbers, to, to your point, and co common requirements, I think, can um, drive us all forward faster because you know what that 2B is. I'd offer, it's hard to um, get mind share around the 2B if you don't understand the as is. And, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, meet with uh, different CIOs and other IT leaders, you know, pretty frequently, and I always share that, you know, you don't need to buy one of these technologies you're describing, Steve, uh, to get started. You need to really understand how the work and the data flow through the organization today for whatever, you know, processes you want to change first. And while that requires human resources to people to do it, it doesn't necessarily require uh, an investment in a, in a technology. We get those things down. Now, do it's a lot easier, I think, in some ways to think about what the process should be. Once you know what the process is, in my sense is that might uncover some of the data, Ted, that you're describing that, you know, data needs that people have because they don't have the data, they don't know what it means, they don't know where it comes from. And these things are, as you're all describing, highly interrelated today. And, you know, I think that's also an important takeaway for the, for the audience. It's not just an HR IT system. It's not just a, a data project. It's not just a modernization project. You know, we can work together a lot of these, a lot of these themes and, uh, you know, again, speak from experience that drives the conversation, you know, forward. It makes it very current and highly, um, you know, I think very interesting to the rest of, rest of the agency to throw these these things together. And they are really, um, really related. So we, we are coming to the end of our um, presentation, but I, I want to give everybody a chance for a final thought or two. Um, Melvin, um, what would you what do you want to make sure the audience um, leaves with today? I think what, one of the things that often gets overlooked, at least from my side, is is everybody focuses on the technology. We don't focus on the people. And, you know, everything that we do inside of CIO, we built a, a change, an organizational change management group to help manage the changes of everything that we deliver from a technology perspective. And so I, I think it's important to know that just turning the technology on doesn't make you more modern. You got to train the people on how to use it and you got to solve the business problem for which they have. And so that would be my, my takeaway is, is don't just pick a technology for the sake of picking a technology. And just because you turned it on doesn't make you modern. 
you got to be able to facilitate the data that people need to make decisions with it. And you got to show them how to use it so that they can get to the solutions that they're looking for. Thank you, Mel. Great, great point. Change management. Uh, Ted, final thought. I'll, I'll go back to a couple of things that Melvin and, and Steve brought up. I think Steve talked about it as systems thinking. So one thing that I didn't think we talked about in this conversation was, you know, going out to whoever, whatever agency partners may be in the line, you know, we're looking for your ideas. We want the innovation to continue at OPM. We want it to continue at the agency level. We've had a couple of examples of where an agency has developed a data solution that we're now, you know, scaling. NIH developed a, a great tool around FEVs, which we have incorporated into our ideas around the, the dashboards we're now going to build for agencies. So please keep up the innovation and uh, we want to work with you and, uh, and and be able to scale wherever possible. So that's also important. Steve, you, you get the uh, final thought, final, final thought. All right. My final thought is this is just really an exciting time to be part of the public sector mission. And that should be true whether you are in government or one of our industry partners. And there's a lot of work to be done amongst all of us, but you can just sense the excitement and the opportunity. We're, we're making some real progress, but we need everybody in this fight. And um, really appreciate everybody's interest in this topic. Thank you, Steve. Um, you know, that's, that, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for our conversation. I feel like we could definitely keep keep going. There's a lot to this. I mean, we could do a part two one of these days. But, you know, I think this idea of employee experience, the focus we have on it, just like you said, uh, Steve, it is um, a great time to be a part of it. We finally have mindshare that this is this is really important. And I, and I think every time you make a federal employee's life a little bit easier, uh, it's a small but really important step towards building a, um, the government we all deserve. And, you know, these projects are not easy you provided you all provided some great ideas on how to get started and how to move forward um just the the idea of making sure that there's change management you know is always uh, often lost i'll say not always often lost so um do these pro just don't buy the technology figure out how to train people and get them to use it successfully you know the systems thinking i thought was an was an excellent point you both you know hit at the end and um i, I really like the point about strength in numbers you know, when agencies come together, they can accomplish a lot. And um, hopefully everybody, um, you know, heard that OPM, the OPM team here is accessible. The QSMO is accessible, TED's accessible. You know, reach out, you know, with opportunities and ideas. And I guarantee you, Melvin will talk to you as well if you, you want to understand what they're, what they're doing at OPM. So we are very fortunate to have uh, these, these three with us today. I cannot thank you guys enough for doing this. It means a lot to me that you're all here. Thank you. Um, to the audience, thanks for attending. Let's continue this conversation. There's a lot we can all do in the space. I just want to quickly thank uh, the DGI team, the ServiceNow team that made this conversation possible today. And Mike, with that, with that, I'll turn it back to you for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you're a fantastic moderator. I'd also like to thank Melvin, Ted, Steve, and Jonathan for sharing their thought leadership and insights on empowering the government uh, workforce with data. Uh, we're going to pull up our quick poll question here. Okay, this is your opportunity. Uh, we have our 930 Gov program coming up. Wednesday, September 6th, and it's free for government, academia, and industry. So if you'd like for us to register you, please uh, check that box. Um, and if you're from industry, we'll send you uh, registration information. It's a five-track program, AI Cloud, Cyber Zero Trust, Data Management, what we discussed today, Enterprise Architecture and Records Management. A quick uh, highlight, Jonathan will be doing a fireside chat with Ben Prime, uh, a senior advisory solution architect with ServiceNow on navigating the road to zero trust as part of that program on September 6th. Last thing, remember to complete your post-event survey. That's where you notify DGI you would like CPE credits. We also want your input on future topics. I'd also like to thank the audience for tuning in today. We very much appreciate your continued support. On behalf of the Digital Government Institute team, this concludes today's program. Have a great day, everyone.